Welcome to Craft Lit, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 460, Calluminator. This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by its listeners. Many thanks and much gratefulness to all of the listeners who have gone over to patreon.com slash craftlet and pledged their support to the show. We couldn't do it without you. Thank you. Well, hello. I hope you are well. I am well. I am dripping, but it's late at night. And if I don't record now, I'm never going to record. So here we go. First off. I think I am going to need to put Crafty Chats on hold until September. It's just crazy to keep trying <laughs> to keep trying to do anything that is either crafty or creative or live streaming during the day. So crafty stuff is just on hold until the weather breaks and September rolls around and life gets back to kind of a normal pattern that makes it easy to plan for regular things like every Tuesday at 1.30 Eastern. So that's number one. Number two, Diane has alerted me that spots on the Scotland tour for June 2018 are going fast. That means if you are at all interested, please, please, please phone in and get your reservation. That reserves you a space. This becomes very important for two reasons. One, It's important because this reservation, I think it's $200 down, is fully refundable up until a certain cutoff date. And we've got plenty of time until then. Diane and Holiday Vacations can tell you all sorts of details about that. But that is the long and short of it. Reserve your space and that way you're safe because very, very soon our tour is going to go into the big Holiday Vacation catalog. Once that happens, it is no longer just you who are trying to reserve spaces. It's you and the entire nation, possibly even more. So it is you and the entire world. And at that point, I can't control, I can't control anything after that. Not that I'm really in control of a whole lot right now, but I want to make sure that if you think you might be able to go, you get your reservation in now. All you have to do is call Diane at 1-800-826-2266. You can ask for Diane or anyone who you can talk to can give you the skinny on our tour. So that is that. Number three, we got a voicemail. Uh, This actually came in last week but the timing was off, so I wasn't able to get it and put it into the show last week. But this is from Caroline, who is commenting on a very important thing that happened in chapters 82 and 83. So here's Caroline. Hi, Heather. It's Caroline in Baltimore, otherwise known as Fiddle Twist. I was thinking after the last chapter, 82 and 83, that this is the first time in the book that The Count has mentioned out loud his original name. We don't hear it, but Carterus hears it. And I'm wondering if this is going to be some kind of turning point for the character as he acknowledges that identity more and more, whether he's going to change in some way. I am not sure I have an opinion about what it might be, but I thought it was an interesting moment. Looking forward to more chapters, even though sometimes in between chapters, I think, holy cow, will you get on with it? There's 30 chapters left in this book. Um, but anyway, I do enjoy each chapter. Thanks. So, yes, I think we have hit a turning point, And thank goodness, because if we weren't going to hit it now, I mean, it's got to happen sometime, right? We're, we are closing in on the end of the book. And today you are getting three whole chapters because I'm trying to pick up the pace a little bit. Also because the pace of the book itself is picking up. So it's kind of appropriate, I think. Uh, But yes, yes, definitely. The fact that even though we didn't hear him say it, the fact 
that the Count of Monte Cristo actually uttered his real name. We don't know if he said Edmund Dantes or just Edmund or Dantes or what, but he said it to Caderousse and then eliminated Caderousse from the list of people who he needed to bring the sword of justice down upon. That's huge. And I think it is poetically appropriate as well as thematically appropriate and dramatically appropriate that that's the way that the turning point was kind of signaled to us. We now have a voicemail from Joy at Craft Nomad, and this is what Joy had to say. Hello, Heather and Craft listeners. My attitude toward fiction is that there's a lot to be gained from relating facts, but it's sometimes important to consider the times and the intent of the author. I think it's sometimes best to consider whether our research is truly relevant. Otherwise, we deprive ourselves of the enjoyment of a wonderful story by pressing our modern attitudes on historical literature. The interpretation of the sins of the father over many years of debate of the Torah by very learned rabbis is interesting, but I think outside the scope of Dumas' belief system. Even today, I think it's a very liberal or shall we say progressive point of view. If we look at our socio-political situation today, the sins of the fathers are indeed being visited on the sons. When I think of our most pressing problems, I often feel some responsibility due to the fact that the actions of my generation and my parents' generation created these problems. Just take pollutions for one example. This is how I was thinking about the Count's remark about the sins of the father. I thought the Count was reciting this well-known phrase because he realizes this is the present situation and perhaps even has pity. I think you'll see in the future chapters, it's not evil and there's a plan. I think we must also forego our revulsion of the idea of slavery when reading historical novels. In the case of Eastern culture, there's very little, little difference between slave and servant in those times. And as far as Europe goes, the custom of having servants, people in service, it is actually a form of slavery. If you watch the historical documentary about servants' lives in England on YouTube, I believe you'll find that this is abundantly clear, and I think there's no difference in France. Thank you, and bye. So I wanted to, first of all, say that I think this is a really important, uh, a couple of really important points, and I really hope that I didn't push too hard on trying to force 21st century uh, mores and values onto Alexandre Dumas. I try really hard not to do that. I think it's hard. Sometimes it's going to happen. But it's it's something that's come up with almost every book that we've done on the podcast at some point, that there, there are quite prominent differences between uh, our time and the time that these authors were writing. And I absolutely agree that, well, honestly, I think it's kind of dangerous to push our vision of the world, progressive or otherwise, onto the, the past. I think it's a good thing to be able to discuss it and look at it and say, wow, I'm glad things aren't like that anymore. And that's fine. But to try and push them into a shape that looks more like our world today is putting you in a position where you're very likely to miss the point that the author was trying to make. That said, I had to cut a little bit out of Joy's comment because I didn't want to give things away. And so that might give Joy a bit of a hint of why I've said some things the way that I've said them. I don't want to be any more obvious than that. And I apologize for being as oblique as that was. But I think the sins of the father thing is super crazy important right now because you're going to hear it again and again and again and again on the way out of this book. And I am going to bite my tongue and not say any more than that. I do, however, want to put a call out to people, especially who can read French fluently. As I was listening to, to Joy's comment, I was thinking, oh yeah, that's a really good point. That's a really good point. And then suddenly I went, wait a minute. I actually don't know what Alexandre Dumas' points of view 
him himself just as a person not as the author of this particular book but just him qua him i don't know what his point of view is on slavery it's got to be kind of complicated with his family history and when we are talking about slavery in general i try to be very specific when we're talking about certainly early american chattel slavery versus biblical slavery versus servitude and the very narrow line between indentured servitude and slavery or or even non-indentured servitude just being in service there were lots of things that you didn't have control over in those situations and certainly one could argue that that makes you at least a wage slave if not worse so Dumas family history has to put him in a weird position when it comes to uh, discussions of slavery because he was so close generationally to someone who is at least suspected of being a slave. Uh, there are some people who, or some researchers who seem to think it's it's very clearly that his grandmother was a slave and others who think very clearly that she wasn't. I don't know. All I can do is report what I find. But it also occurred to me that he may have some really interesting points of view or may have had really interesting points of view on the sins of the father, just in general. And keeping that in the back of your mind as we go further towards the conclusion of the book is probably not a bad idea. I have a feeling that you're going to have lots and lots of interesting things that pop up in your head as you listen through the, the last eighth of the book. God, this is a huge book. And please, when those ideas do pop into your head, please either call on SpeakPipe, which you can get to from the craftlit.com site. It'll pop up as a little sidebar thingy on the right-hand side, or call area code 206-350-1642. SpeakPipe is the cheapest, easiest solution if you are an international listener, and the 206 number is likely the easiest for you in the States. All right, whew. let's listen to chapters 86, 87, and 88. I promise there is a reason why we are doing so many chapters this week. And you are not gonna hear much from me on the flip side. So that's pretty much it. Here we go with our chapters for today of The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 86 The Trial At eight o'clock in the morning, Albert had arrived at Beauchamp's door. The valet de chambre had received orders to usher him in at once. Beauchamp was in his bath. Here I am, said Albert. Well, my poor friend, replied Beauchamp, I expected you. I need not say, I think you are too faithful and too kind to have spoken of that painful circumstance. Your having sent for me is another proof of your affection. So, without losing time, tell me, have you the slightest idea whence this terrible blow proceeds? I think I have some clue. But first tell me all the particulars of this shameful plot. Beauchamp proceeded to relate to the young man, who was overwhelmed with shame and grief, the following facts. Two days previously, the article had appeared in another paper besides the impartial, and, what was more serious, one that was well known as a government paper. Beauchamp was breakfasting when he read the paragraph. He sent immediately for a cabriolet, and hastened to the publisher's office. Although professing diametrically opposite principles from those of the editor of the other paper, Beauchamp, as it sometimes, we may say often, happens, was his intimate friend. The editor was reading, with apparent delight, a leading article in the same paper on beet sugar, probably a composition of his own. "'Ah, pardieu,' said Beauchamp, "'with the paper in your hand, my friend, "'I need not tell you the cause of my visit.' "'Are you interested in the sugar question?' "'asked the editor of the ministerial paper. "'No,' replied Beauchamp, "'I have not considered the question. "'A totally different subject interests me.' "'What is it?' "'The article relative to Morcerf. "'Indeed?' Is it not a curious affair? So curious that I think you are running a great risk of a prosecution for defamation of character. Not at all. 
we have received with the information all the requisite proofs and we are quite sure monsieur de morcerf will not raise his voice against us besides it is rendering a service to one's country to denounce these wretched criminals who are unworthy of the honour bestowed on them beauchamp was thunderstruck who then has so correctly informed you asked he for my paper which gave the first information on the subject has been obliged to stop for want of proof and yet we are more interested than you in exposing m de morcerf as he is a peer of france and we are of the opposition oh that is very simple we have not sought to scandalize this news was brought to us a man arrived yesterday from janina bringing a formidable array of documents and when we hesitated to publish the accusatory article he told us it should be inserted in some other paper beauchamp understood that nothing remained but to submit and left the office to dispatch a courier to morcerf but he had been unable to send to albert the following particulars as the events had transpired after the messenger's departure namely that the same day a great agitation was manifest in the house of peers among the usually calm members of that dignified assembly everyone had arrived almost before the usual hour and was conversing on the melancholy event which was to attract the attention of the public towards one of their most illustrious colleagues some were perusing the article others making comments and recalling circumstances which substantiated the charges still more the count of morcerf was no favorite with his colleagues like all upstarts he had had recourse to a great deal of haughtiness to maintain his position the true nobility laughed at him the talented repelled him and the honorable instinctively despised him he was in fact in the unhappy position of the victim marked for sacrifice the finger of god once pointed at him every one was prepared to raise the hue and cry the count of morcerf alone was ignorant of the news he did not take in the paper containing the defamatory article and had passed the morning in writing letters and in trying a horse he arrived at his usual hour with a proud look and insolent demeanor he alighted passed through the corridors and entered the house without observing the hesitation of the doorkeepers or the coolness of his colleagues business had already been going on for half an hour when he entered every one held the accusing paper but as usual no one liked to take upon himself the responsibility of the attack at length an honorable peer morcerf's acknowledged enemy ascended the tribune with that solemnity which announced that the expected moment had arrived there was an impressive silence morcerf alone knew not why such profound attention was given to an orator who was not always listened to with so much complacency the count did not notice the introduction in which the speaker announced that his communication would be of that vital importance that it demanded the undivided attention of the house but at the mention of janina and colonel fernand he turned so frightfully pale that every member shuddered and fixed his eyes upon him moral wounds have this peculiarity they may be hidden but they never close always painful always ready to bleed when touched they remain fresh and open in the heart the article having been read during the painful hush that followed a universal shudder pervaded the assembly and immediately the closest attention was given to the orator as he resumed his remarks he stated his scruples and the difficulties of the case it was the honor of monsieur de morcerf and that of the whole house he proposed to defend by provoking a debate on personal questions which are always such painful themes of discussion he concluded by calling for an investigation which might dispose of the calumnious report before it had time to spread and restore m de morcerf to the position he had long held in public opinion morcerf was so completely overwhelmed by this great and unexpected calamity that he could scarcely stammer a few words as he looked around on the assembly this timidity which might proceed from the astonishment of innocence as well as the shame of guilt conciliated some in his favour for men who are truly generous are always ready to compassionate when the misfortune of their enemy surpasses the limits of their hatred 
the president put it to the vote and it was decided that the investigation should take place the count was asked what time he required to prepare his defence Morcerf's courage had revived when he found himself alive after this horrible blow my lords answered he it is not by time i could repel the attack made on me by enemies unknown to me and doubtless hidden in obscurity it is immediately and by a thunderbolt that i must repel the flash of lightning which for a moment startled me oh that i could instead of taking up this defence shed my last drop of blood to prove to my noble colleagues that i am their equal in worth these words made a favourable impression on behalf of the accused i demand then that the examination shall take place as soon as possible and i will furnish the house with all necessary information what day do you fix asked the president to-day i am at your service replied the count the president rang the bell does the house approve that the examination should take place to-day yes was the unanimous answer a committee of twelve members was chosen to examine the proofs brought forward by morcerf the investigation would begin at eight o'clock that evening in the committee room and if postponement were necessary the proceedings would be resumed each evening at the same hour morcerf asked leave to retire he had to collect the documents he had long been preparing against this storm which his sagacity had foreseen albert listened trembling now with hope then with anger and then again with shame for from beauchamp's confidence he knew his father was guilty and he asked himself how since he was guilty he could prove his innocence beauchamp hesitated to continue his narrative what next asked albert what next my friend you impose a painful task on me must you know all absolutely and rather from your lips than another's muster up all your courage then for never have you required it more albert passed his hand over his forehead as if to try his strength as a man who is preparing to defend his life proves his shield and bends his sword he thought himself strong enough for he mistook fever for energy go on said he the evening arrived all paris was in expectation many said your father had only to show himself to crush the charge against him many others said he would not appear while some asserted that they had seen him start for brussels and others went to the police office to inquire if he had taken out a passport i used all my influence with one of the committee a young peer of my acquaintance to get admission to one of the galleries he called for me at seven o'clock and before anyone had arrived asked one of the doorkeepers to place me in a box i was concealed by a column and might witness the whole of the terrible scene which was about to take place at eight o'clock all were in their places and monsieur de morcerf entered at the last stroke he held some papers in his hand his countenance was calm and his step firm and he was dressed with great care in his military uniform which was buttoned completely up to the chin his presence produced a good effect the committee was made up of liberals several of whom came forward to shake hands with him albert felt his heart bursting at these particulars but gratitude mingled with his sorrow he would gladly have embraced those who had given his father this proof of esteem at a moment when his honor was so powerfully attacked at this moment one of the doorkeepers brought in a letter for the president you are at liberty to speak monsieur de morcerf said the president as he unsealed the letter and the count began his defence i assure you albert in a most eloquent and skilful manner he produced documents proving that the vizier of yanina had up to the last moment honoured him with his entire confidence since he had interested him with a negotiation of life and death with the emperor he produced a ring his mark of authority with which ali pasha generally sealed his letters and which the latter had given him that he might on his return at any hour of the day or night gain access to the presence even in the harem unfortunately the negotiation failed and when he returned to defend his benefactor 
he was dead. But, said the Count, so great was Ali Pasha's confidence that on his deathbed he resigned his favourite mistress and her daughter to my care. Albert started on hearing these words. The history of Hadi recurred to him, and he remembered what she had said of that message and the ring, and the manner in which she had been sold and made a slave. "'And what effect did this discourse produce?' anxiously inquired Albert. "'I acknowledge it affected me, and indeed all the committee also,' said Beauchamp. Meanwhile the President carelessly opened the letter which had been brought to him, but the first lines aroused his attention. He read them again and again, and fixing his eyes on Monsieur de Morcerf, "'Count,' said he, "'you have said that the vizier of Yanina confided his wife and daughter to your care.' "'Yes, sir,' replied Morcerf. "'But in that, like all the rest, misfortune pursued me. On my return, Vasiliki and her daughter Heidi had disappeared. Did you know them? My intimacy with the Pasha and his unlimited confidence had gained me an introduction to them, and I had seen them about twenty times. Have you any idea what became of them? Yes, sir. I heard they had fallen victims to their sorrow and perhaps to their poverty. I was not rich. My life was in constant danger. I could not seek them, to my great regret. The President frowned imperceptibly. Gentlemen, said he, you have heard the Comte de Morcerf's defence. Can you, sir, produce any witnesses to the truth of what you have asserted? Alas, no, monsieur, replied the Count. All those surrounding the vizier, or who knew me at his court, are either dead or gone away. I know not where. I believe that I alone, of all my countrymen, survived that dreadful war. I have only the letters of Ali Tepelini, which I have placed before you, the ring, a token of his good will, which is here, and lastly, the most convincing proof I can offer, after an anonymous attack, and that is the absence of any witness against my veracity and the purity of my military life. A murmur of approbation ran through the assembly and at this moment Albert had nothing more transpired, your father's cause had been gained. It only remained to put it to the vote, when the President resumed, "'Gentlemen, and you, monsieur, you will not be displeased, I presume, to listen to one who calls himself a very important witness, and who has just presented himself. He is doubtless come to prove the perfect innocence of our colleague.' Here is a letter I have just received on the subject. Shall it be read, or shall it be passed over? And shall we take no notice of this incident? Monsieur de Morcerf turned pale, and clinched his hands on the papers he held. The committee decided to hear the letter. The count was thoughtful and silent. The président read. Monsieur President, I can furnish the committee of inquiry into the conduct of the lieutenant-general the Count of Morcerf in Epirus and in Macedonia with important particulars. The president paused, and the Count turned pale. The president looked at his auditors. Proceed, was heard on all sides. The president resumed. I was on the spot at the death of Ali Pasha. I was present during these last moments. I know what is become of Vasiliki and Hedi. I am at the command of the committee, and even claim the honour of being heard. I shall be in the lobby when this note is delivered to you. And who is this witness, or rather this enemy? asked the Count in a tone in which there was a visible alteration. We shall know, sir, replied the President. Is the committee willing to hear this witness? Yes, yes they all said at once. The doorkeeper was called. "'Is there anyone in the lobby?' said the President. "'Yes, sir.' "'Who is it?' "'A woman, accompanied by a servant.' Everyone looked at his neighbour. "'Bring her in,' said the President. Five minutes after the doorkeeper again appeared, all eyes were fixed on the door, and I,' said Beauchamp, "'shared the general expectation and anxiety. Behind the doorkeeper, walked a woman enveloped in a large veil, which completely concealed her. 
it was evident from her figure and the perfumes she had about her that she was young and fastidious in her tastes, but that was all. The president requested her to throw aside her veil, and it was then seen that she was dressed in the Grecian costume and was remarkably beautiful. Ah, oh, said Albert, it was she. Who? Hedy. Who told you that? Alas, I guess it. But go on, Beauchamp. You see, I am calm and strong, and yet we must be drawing near the disclosure. Monsieur de Morcerf, continued Beauchamp, looked at this woman with a surprise and terror. Her lips were about to pass his sentence of life or death. To the committee, the adventure was so extraordinary and curious that the interest they had felt for the Count's safety became now quite a secondary matter. The president himself advanced to a place a seat for the young lady, but she declined, availing herself of it. As for the Count, he had fallen on his chair. It was evident that his legs refused to support him. Madame, said the president, you have engaged to furnish the committee with some important particulars respecting the affair at Yanina, and you have stated that you are an eyewitness of the event. I was indeed, said the stranger with a tone of sweet melancholy and with the sonorous voice peculiar to the East. But allow me to say that you must have been very young then. I was four years old. But as those events deeply concerned me, not a single detail was escaped from my memory. In what manner could these events concern you? And who are you that they should have made so deep an impression on you? On them depended my father's life, replied she. I am Hedy, the daughter of Ali Tepelini, Pasha of Yanina, and of Vasiliki, his beloved wife. The blush of mingled pride and modesty which suddenly suffused the cheeks of the young woman, the brilliancy of her eye and her highly important communication, produced an indescribable effect on the assembly. As for the Count, he could not have been more overwhelmed if a thunderbolt had fallen at his feet and opened an immense gulf before him. Madame, replied the President, bowing with profound respect, allow me to ask one question. It shall be the last. Can you prove the authenticity of what you have now stated? I can, sir, said Hedy, drawing from under her veil a satin satchel highly perfumed. For here is the register of my birth, signed by my father and his principal officers, and that of my baptism, my father having consented to my being brought up in my mother's faith. This latter has been sealed with the grand primate of Macedonia and Epirus. And lastly, and perhaps the most important, the record of the sale of my person and that of my mother, to the Armenian merchant El Corbir, by the French officer, who, in his infamous bargain with the Porte, had reserved as his part of the booty the wife and daughter of his benefactor, whom he sold for the sum of four hundred thousand francs. A greenish pallor spread over the Count's cheeks, and his eyes became bloodshot at these terrible imputations, which were listened to by the assembly with ominous silence. Hedy, still calm, but with a calmness more dreadful than the anger of another would have been, handed to the President the record of her sale, written in Arabic. It had been supposed some of the papers might be in the Arabian, Romaic, or Turkish language, and the interpreter of the house was in attendance. One of the noble peers, who was familiar with the Arabic language, having studied it during the famous Egyptian campaign, followed with his eyes as the translator read aloud. I, El Kobir, a slave merchant and purveyor of the arm of his highness, acknowledge having received for transmission to the sublime emperor from the French lord, the Count of Monte Cristo, an emerald valued at eight hundred thousand francs as the ransom of a young Christian slave of eleven years of age, named Aidi, the acknowledged daughter of the late Lord Ali Tepelini, Pasha of Yanina and of Vasiliki, his favourite, 
she having been sold to me seven years previously with her mother who had died on arriving at constantinople by a french colonel in the service of the vizier ali tepelini named fernand mondego the above-mentioned purchase was made on his highness's account whose mandate i had for the sum of four hundred thousand francs given at constantinople by authority of his highness in the year twelve forty seven of the hegira signed el kobir that this record should have all due authority it shall bear the imperial seal which the vendor is bound to have affixed to it near the merchant's signature there was indeed the seal of the sublime emperor a dreadful silence followed the reading of this document the count could only stare and his gaze fixed as if unconsciously on haiti seemed one of fire and blood madame said the president may reference be made to the count of monte cristo who is now i believe in paris sir replied haiti the count of monte cristo my foster father has been in normandy the last three days who then has counselled you to take this step one for which the court is deeply indebted to you and which is perfectly natural considering your birth and your misfortunes sir replied haiti i have been led to take this step from a feeling of respect and grief although a christian may god forgive me i have always sought to revenge my illustrious father since i set my foot in france and knew the traitor lived in paris i have watched carefully i live retired in the house of my noble protector but i do it from my choice i love retirement and silence because i can live with my thoughts and recollections of my past days but the count of monte cristo surrounds me with every paternal care and i am ignorant of nothing which passes in the world i learn all in the silence of my apartments for instance i see all the newspapers every periodical as well as every new piece of music and by thus watching the course of the life of others i learned what had transpired this morning in the house of peers and what was to take place this evening when i wrote then remarked the president the count of monte cristo knows nothing of your present proceedings he is quite unaware of them and i have but one fear which is that he should disapprove of what i have done but it is a glorious day for me continued the young girl raising her ardent gaze to heaven that on which i find at last an opportunity of avenging my father the count had not uttered one word the whole of this time his colleagues looked at him and doubtless pitied his prospects blighted under the perfumed breath of a woman his misery was depicted in sinister lines on his countenance monsieur de morcerf said the president do you recognize this lady as the daughter of ali tepelini pasha of janina no said morcerf attempting to rise it is a base plot contrived by my enemies haydi whose eyes had been fixed on the door as if expecting someone turned hastily and seeing the count standing shrieked you do not know me said she well i fortunately recognize you you are fernand mondego the french officer who led the troops of my noble father it is you who surrendered the castle of janina it is you who were sent by him to constantinople to treat with the emperor for the life or death of your benefactor brought back a false mandate granting full pardon it is you who with that mandate obtained the pasha's ring which gave you authority of the selim the firekeeper it is you who stabbed selim it is you who sold us my mother and me to the merchant el kobir assassin 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 you have still on your brow your master's blood look gentlemen all these words had been pronounced with such enthusiasm and evident truth that every eye was fixed on the count's forehead and he himself passed his hand across it, as if he felt Ali's blood still lingered there. "'You positively recognize Monsieur de Morcerf as the officer, Fernand Mondego?' "'Indeed I do,' cried Haiti. 
"'Oh, my mother, it was you who said. "'You were free. "'You had a beloved father. "'You were destined to be almost a queen. "'Look well at that man. "'It is he who raised your father's head "'on the point of a spear. "'It is he who sold us. "'It is he who forsook us. "'Look well at his right hand, "'on which he has a large wound. "'If you forgot his features, "'you would know him by that hand, "'into which fell, one by one, "'the gold pieces of the merchant El Copir. "'I know him!' "'Ah, let him say now, if he does not recognize me!' Each word fell like a dagger on Morcerf, and deprived him of a portion of his energy as she uttered the last. He hid his mutilated hand hastily on his bosom, and fell back on his seat, overwhelmed by wretchedness and despair. This scene completely changed the opinion of the assembly respecting the accused Count. "'Count of Morcerf,' said the President, "'do not allow yourself to be cast down.' Answer. The justice of the court is supreme and impartial as that of God. It will not suffer you to be trampled on by your enemies without giving you an opportunity of defending yourself. Shall further inquiries be made? Shall two members of the house be sent to Yanina? Speak. Morcerf did not reply. Then all the members looked at each other with terror. They knew the Count's energetic and violent temper. It must be indeed a dreadful blow which would deprive him of courage to defend himself. They expected that his stupefied silence would be followed by a fiery outburst. Well, asked the President, what is your decision? I have no reply to make, said the Count in a low tone. Has the daughter of Ali Tepelini spoken the truth? said the President. Is she then the terrible witness to whose charge you dare not plead not guilty? Have you really committed the crimes of which you are accused? The Count looked around him with an expression which might have softened tigers, but which could not disarm his judges. Then he raised his eyes toward the ceiling, but withdrew them immediately, as if he feared the roof would open and reveal to his distressed view that second tribunal called Evan and that other judge named God. Then, with a hasty movement, he tore open his coat, which seemed to stifle him, and flew from the room like a madman. His footstep was heard one moment in the corridor, then the rattling of his carriage wheels as he was driven rapidly away. Gentlemen, said the President, when silence was restored, is the Count of Morcerf convicted of felony? "'Treason and conduct unbecoming a member of this house?' "'Yes,' replied all the members of the Committee of Inquiry, with a unanimous voice. Hedy had remained until the close of the meeting. She heard the Count's sentence pronounced without betraying an expression of joy or pity. Then, drawing her veil over her face, she bowed majestically to the councillors, and left with that dignified step which Virgil attributes to his goddesses. End of chapter 86 Chapter 87 The Challenge Then, continued Beauchamp, I took advantage of the silence and the darkness to leave the house without being seen. The usher who had introduced me was waiting for me at the door, and he conducted me through the corridors to a private entrance opening into the Rue de Vaugirard. I left with mingled feelings of sorrow and delight. Excuse me, Albert, sorrow on your account, and delight with that noble girl, thus pursuing paternal vengeance. Yes, Albert, from whatever source the blow may have proceeded, it may be from an enemy, but that enemy is only the agent of Providence. Albert held his head between his hands, he raised his face, red with shame and bathed in tears, and seizing Beauchamp's arm, "'My friend,' said he, "'my life is ended. I cannot come the same with you. Providence has struck the blow. But I must discover who pursues me with this hatred, and when I have found him I shall kill him, or he will kill me. I rely on your friendship to assist me, Beauchamp, if contempt has not banished it from your heart.' "'Contempt, my friend? How does this misfortune affect you?' "'No, 
happily that unjust prejudice is forgotten which made the son responsible for the father's actions review your life albert although it is only just beginning did a lovely summer's day ever dawn with greater purity than has marked the commencement of your career no albert take my advice you are young and rich leave paris all is soon forgotten in this great babylon of excitement and changing tastes you will return after three or four years with a russian princess for a bride and no one will think more of what occurred yesterday than if it had happened sixteen years ago thank you my dear beauchamp thank you for the excellent feeling which prompts your advice but it cannot be i have told you my wish or rather my determination you understand that interested as i am in this affair i cannot see it in the same light as you do what appears to you to emanate from a celestial source seems to me to proceed from one far less pure providence appears to me to have no share in this affair and happily so for instead of the invisible impalpable agent of celestial rewards and punishments i shall find one both palpable and visible on whom i shall revenge myself i assure you for all i have suffered during the last month now i repeat beauchamp i wish to return to human and material existence and if you are still the friend you profess to be help me to discover the hand that struck the blow be it so said beauchamp if you must have me descend to earth i submit and if you will seek your enemy i will assist you and i will engage to find him my honor being almost as deeply interested as yours well then you understand beauchamp that we begin our search immediately each moment's delay is an eternity for me the calumniator is not yet punished and he may hope that he will not be but on my honor if he thinks so he deceives himself well listen morcerf ah beauchamp i see you know something already you will restore me to life i do not say there is any truth in what i am going to tell you but it is at least a ray of light in a dark night by following it we may discover perhaps something more certain tell me satisfy my impatience well i will tell you what i did not like to mention on my return from janina say on i went of course to the chief banker of the town to make inquiries at the first word before i had even mentioned your father's name ah said he i guess what brings you here how and why because a fortnight since i was questioned on the same subject by whom by a paris banker my correspondent whose name is danglars he cried albert yes it is indeed he who has no long pursued my father with jealous hatred he the man who would be popular cannot forgive the count of morcerf for being created a peer and this marriage broken off without a reason being assigned yes it is all from the same cause make inquiries albert but do not be angry without reason make inquiries and if it be true oh yes if it be true cried the young man he shall pay me all i have suffered beware morcerf he is already an old man i will respect his age as he has respected the honor of my family if my father had offended him why did he not attack him personally oh no he was afraid to encounter him face to face i do not condemn you albert i only restrain you act prudently oh do not fear besides you will accompany me beauchamp solemn transactions should be sanctioned by a witness before this day closes if monsieur danglars is guilty he shall cease to live or i shall die pardieu beauchamp mine shall be a splendid funeral when such resolutions are made albert they should be promptly executed do you wish to go to monsieur danglars let us go immediately they sent for a cabriolet on entering the banker's mansion they perceived the phaeton and servant of monsieur andrea cavalcanti 
Ah, parbleu. That's good, said Albert with a gloomy tone. If Monsieur Danglars will not fight with me, I will kill his son-in-law. Cavalcanti will certainly fight. The servant announced the young man, but the banker, recollecting what had transpired the day before, did not wish him admitted. It was, however, too late. Albert had followed the footman, and, hearing the order given, forced the door open, and, followed by Beauchamp, found himself in the banker's study. "'Sir,' cried the latter, "'am I no longer at liberty to receive whom I choose in my house? You appear to forget yourself sadly.' "'No, sir,' said Albert coldly. "'There are circumstances in which one cannot, except through cowardice. "'I offer you that refuge. "'Refuse to admit certain persons at least. "'What is your errand, then, with me, sir?' "'I mean,' said Albert, drawing near, "'and without apparently noticing Cavalcanti, "'who stood with his back towards the fireplace, "'I mean to propose a meeting in some retired corner "'where no one will interrupt us for ten minutes.' that will be sufficient. Where two men, having met, one of them will remain on the ground. Danglars turned pale. Cavalcanti moved a step forward, and Albert turned towards him. "'And you too,' said he. "'Come if you like, monsieur. You have a claim, being almost one of the family, and I will give as many rendezvous of that kind as I can find persons willing to accept them.' Cavalcanti looked at Danglars with a stupefied air, and the latter, making an effort, arose and stepped between the two young men. Albert's attack on Andrea had placed him on a different footing, and he hoped this visit had another cause than that he had first supposed. "'Indeed, sir,' said he to Albert, "'if you are come to quarrel with this gentleman because I have preferred him to you, I shall resign the case to the king's attorney.' "'You mistake, sir,' said Morcerf, with a gloomy smile. "'I am not referring in the least to matrimony, "'and I only address myself to Monsieur Cavalcanti "'because he appeared disposed to interfere between us. "'In one respect, you are right, "'for I am ready to quarrel with everyone today, "'but you have the first claim, Monsieur Donglar.' "'Sir,' replied Donglar, pale with anger and fear. "'I warn you, when I have the misfortune to meet with a mad dog, I kill it, and far from thinking myself guilty of a crime, I believe I do society a kindness. Now, if you are mad and try to bite me, I will kill you without pity. Is it my fault that your father has dishonoured himself?' "'Yes, miserable wretch,' cried Morcerf. "'It is your fault.' Danglars retreated a few steps. "'My fault?' said he. "'You must be mad. What do I know of the Grecian affair? Have I travelled in that country? Did I advise your father to sell the castle of Yanina to betray—' "'Silence!' said Albert, with a thundering voice. "'No, it is not you who have directly made this exposure and brought this sorrow on us, but you hypocritically provoked it.' "'I?' "'Yes, you. How came it known? "'I suppose you read it in the paper on the account from Yanina. "'Who wrote to Yanina?' "'To Yanina? "'Yes, who wrote for particulars concerning my father?' "'I imagine any one may write to Yanina. "'But one person only wrote. "'One only?' "'Yes, and that was you.' "'I doubtless wrote. It appears to me that when about to marry your daughter to a young man, it is right to make some inquiries respecting his family. It is not only a right, but a duty.' "'You wrote, sir, knowing what answer you would receive.' "'I? Indeed, I assure you,' cried Danglars with a confidence and security proceeding less from fear than from the interest he really felt for the young man.' I solemnly declare to you that I should never have thought of writing to Yanina did I know anything of Ali Pasha's misfortunes. Who then urged you to write? Tell me. Pardieu, it was the most simple thing in the world. I was speaking of your father's past history. 
I said the origin of his fortune remained obscure. The person to whom I addressed my scruples asked me where your father had acquired his property. I answered, in Greece. Then, said he, write to Yanina. And who thus advised you? No other than your friend, Monte Cristo. The Count of Monte Cristo told you to write to Yanina? Yes, and I wrote, and will show you my correspondence, if you like. Albert and Beauchamp looked at each other. Sir, said Beauchamp, who had not yet spoken, you appear to accuse the Count, who is absent from Paris at this moment, and cannot justify himself. I accuse no one, sir, said Danglars. I relate, and I will repeat before the Count what I have said to you. "'Does the Count know what answer you received?' "'Yes, I showed it to him. "'Did he know my father's Christian name was Fernand, "'and his family name Mondego?' "'Yes, I had told him that long since, "'and I did only what any other would have done in my circumstances, "'and perhaps less, "'when, the day after the arrival of this answer, "'your father came by the advice of Monte Cristo "'to ask my daughter's hand for you.' I decidedly refused him, but without any explanation or exposure. In short, why should I have any more to do with the affair? How did the honour or disgrace of Monsieur de Morcerf affect me? It neither increased nor decreased my income. Albert felt the blood mounting to his brow. There was no doubt upon the subject. Danglars defended himself with the baseness but at the same time with the assurance of a man who speaks the truth, at least in part, if not wholly, not for conscience's sake, but through fear. Besides, what was Morcerf seeking? It was not whether Danglars or Monte Cristo was more or less guilty. It was a man who would answer for the offence, whether trifling or serious. It was a man who would fight, and it was evident Danglars would not fight. And in addition to this, Everything forgotten or unperceived before presented itself now to his recollection. Monte Cristo knew everything. As he had bought the daughter of Ali Pasha, and knowing everything, he had advised Danglars to write to Yanina. The answer known, he had yielded to Albert's wish to be introduced to Haiti, and allowed the conversation to turn on the death of Ali, and had not opposed Haiti's recital but having doubtless warned the young girl in the few Romaic words he spoke to her not to implicate Morcerf's father. Besides, had he not begged of Morcerf not to mention his father's name before Haiti? Lastly, he had taken Albert to Normandy when he knew the final blow was near. There could be no doubt that all had been calculated and previously arranged. Monte Cristo, then, was in league with his father's enemies— Albert took Beauchamp aside and communicated these ideas to him. "'You are right,' said the latter. "'Monsieur Danglars has only been a secondary agent in this sad affair, and it is of Monsieur de Monte Cristo that you must demand an explanation.' Albert turned. "'Sir,' said he to Danglars, "'understand that I do not take a final leave of you. I must ascertain if your insinuations are just.' and I'm going now to inquire of the Count of Monte Cristo. He bowed to the banker, and went out with Beauchamp, without appearing to notice Cavalcanti. Danglars accompanied him to the door, where he again assured Albert that no motive of personal hatred had influenced him against the Count of Morcerf. End of chapter 87 Chapter 88 The Insult at the banker's door, Beauchamp stopped Morcerf. Listen, said he, just now I told you it was of Monsieur de Monte Cristo you must demand an explanation. Yes, and we are going to his house. Reflect, Morcerf, one moment before you go. On what shall I reflect? On the importance of the step you are taking. Is it more serious than going to Monsieur Danglars? Yes. Monsieur Danglars is a money lover, and those who love money, you know, think too much of what they risk to be easily induced to fight a duel. The other is, on the contrary to all appearance, a true nobleman. But 
Do you not fear to find him a bully? I only fear one thing, namely, to find a man who will not fight. Do not be alarmed, said Beauchamp. He will meet you. My only fear is that you'll be too strong for you. My friend, said Morcerf, with a sweet smile, that is what I wish. The happiest thing that could occur to me would be to die in my father's stead. That would save us all. Your mother would die of grief. My poor mother, said Albert, passing his hand across his eyes. I know she would, but better so than die of shame. Are you quite decided, Albert? Yes. Let us go. But do you think we shall find the Count at home? He intended returning home some hours after me, and doubtless he is now at home. They ordered the driver to take them to number 30 Champs-Élysées. Beauchamp wished to go in alone, but Albert observed that as this was an unusual circumstance, he might be allowed to deviate from the usual etiquette in affairs of honour. The cause which the young man espoused was one so sacred that Beauchamp had only to comply with all his wishes. He yielded and contented himself with following Morcerf. Albert sprang from the porter's lodge to the steps. He was received by Baptistin. The Count had indeed just arrived, but he was in his bath, and had forbidden that any one should be admitted. "'But after his bath?' asked Morcerf. "'My master will go to dinner.' "'And after dinner?' "'He will sleep an hour.' "'Then?' "'He is going to the opera.' "'Are you sure of it?' asked Albert. "'Quite, sir.' My master has ordered his horses at eight o'clock precisely. Very good, replied Albert. That is all I wish to know. Then, turning towards Beauchamp, if you have anything to attend to, Beauchamp, do it directly. If you have any appointment for this evening, defer it till tomorrow. I depend on you to accompany me to the opera, and if you can, bring Chateau Renaud with you. Beauchamp availed himself of Albert's permission and left him, promising to call for him at a quarter before eight. On his return home, Albert expressed his wish to Franz de Bray and Morel to see them at the opera that evening. Then he went to see his mother, who, since the events of the day before, had refused to see anyone and had kept her room. He found her in bed, overwhelmed with grief at this public humiliation. The sight of Albert produced the effect which might naturally be expected on Mercedes. She pressed her son's hand and sobbed aloud, but her tears relieved her. Albert stood one moment speechless by the side of his mother's bed. It was evident from his pale face and knit brows that his resolution to revenge himself was growing weaker. "'My dear mother,' said he, do you know if Monsieur de Morcerf has any enemy? Mercedes started. She noticed that the young man did not say, My father. My son, she said, persons in the Count's situation have many secret enemies. Those who are known are not the most dangerous. I know it, and appeal to your penetration. You are of so superior mind, nothing escapes you. Why did you say so? Because, for instance, you noticed on the evening of the ball we gave that Monsieur de Monte Cristo would eat nothing in our house. Mercedes raised herself on her feverish arm. Monsieur de Monte Cristo, she exclaimed. And how is he connected with the question you asked me? You know, mother, Monsieur de Monte Cristo is almost an Oriental and it is customary with the Orientals to secure full liberty for revenge by not eating or drinking in the houses of their enemies. Do you say Monsieur de Monte Cristo is our enemy? replied Mercedes, becoming paler than the sheet which covered her. Who told you so? Why, you are mad, Albert. Monsieur de Monte Cristo has only shown us kindness. Monsieur de Monte Cristo saved your life. You yourself presented him to us. Oh, I entreat you, my son, if you had entertained such an idea, dispel it. And my counsel to you, nay, my, my prayer, 
is to retain his friendship. Mother, replied the young man, you have a special reasons for telling me to conciliate the man. I, said the Mercedes, blushing as rapidly as she had turned pale, and again became paler than ever. Yes, doubtless, and is it not that he may never do us any harm? Mercedes shuddered, and fixing on her son a scrutinizing gaze, "'You speak strangely,' said she to Albert, "'and you appear to have some singular prejudices. "'What has the Count done? Three days since you were with him in Normandy. "'Only three days since we looked on him as our best friend.' "'An ironical smile passed over Albert's lips. "'Mercedes saw it, and with the double instinct of woman and mother guessed all. "'But as she was prudent and strong-minded, she concealed both her sorrows and her fears. Albert was silent. An instant after, the Countess resumed. "'You came to inquire after my health. I will candidly acknowledge that I am not well. You should install yourself here and cheer my solitude. I do not wish to be left alone.' "'Mother,' said the young man, "'you know how gladly I would obey your wish.' but an urgent and important affair obliges me to leave you for the whole evening. Well, replied Mercedes, sighing, go, Albert, I will not make you a slave to your filial piety. Albert pretended he did not hear, bowed to his mother and quitted her. Scarcely had he shut her door when Mercedes called a confidential servant and ordered him to follow Albert wherever he should go that evening and to come and tell her immediately what he observed. Then she rang for her lady's maid, and, weak as she was, she dressed, in order to be ready for whatever might happen. The footman's mission was an easy one. Albert went to his room, and dressed with unusual care. At ten minutes to eight, Beauchamp arrived. He had seen Chateau Renaud, who had promised to be in the orchestra before the curtain was raised. Both got into Albert's coupé, and as the young man had no reason to conceal where he was going, he called aloud, "'To the opera!' In his impatience, he arrived before the beginning of the performance. Chateau Renaud was at his post. Apprised by Beauchamp of the circumstances, he required no explanation from Albert. The conduct of the son in seeking to avenge his father was so natural that Chateau Renaud did not seek to dissuade him, and was content with renewing his assurances of devotion. De Bray was not yet come, but Albert knew that he seldom lost a scene at the opera. Albert wandered about the theatre until the curtain was drawn up. He hoped to meet with Monsieur de Monte Cristo, either in the lobby or on the stairs. The bell summoned him to his seat, and he entered the orchestra with Chateau Renaud and Beauchamp but his eyes scarcely quitted the box between the columns, which remained obstinately closed during the whole of the first act. At last, as Albert was looking at his watch for about the hundredth time, at the beginning of the second act, the door opened, and Monte Cristo entered, dressed in black, and leaning over the front of the box, looked around the pit. Morel followed him, and looked also for his sister and brother-in-law, he soon discovered them in another box, and kissed his hand to them. The Count, in his survey of the pit, encountered a pale face and threatening eyes, which evidently sought to gain his attention. He recognized Albert, but thought it better not to notice him as he looked so angry and discomposed. Without communicating his thoughts to his companion, he sat down, drew out his opera glass, and looked another way. Although apparently not noticing Albert, he did not, however, lose sight of him, and when the curtain fell at the end of the second act, he saw him leave the orchestra with his two friends. Then his head was seen passing at the back of the boxes, and the Count knew that the approaching storm was intended to fall on him. He was at the moment conversing cheerfully with Morel, but he was well prepared for what might happen. The door opened, and Monte Cristo, turning around, saw Albert, pale and trembling, followed by Beauchamp and Chateau Renaud. "'Well,' 
cried he with that benevolent politeness which distinguished his salutation from the common civilities of the world my cavalier has attained his object good evening monsieur de morcerf the countenance of this man who possessed such extraordinary control over his feelings expressed the most perfect cordiality morel only then recollected the letter he had received from the viscount in which without assigning any reason he begged him to go to the opera but he understood that something terrible was brooding we are not come here sir to exchange hypocritical expressions of politeness or false professions of friendship said albert but to demand an explanation the young man's trembling voice was scarcely audible an explanation at the opera said the count with that calm tone and penetrating eye which characterize the man who knows his cause is good little acquainted as i am with the habits of parisians i should not have thought this the place for such a demand still if people will shut themselves up said albert and cannot be seen because they are bathing dining or asleep we must avail ourselves of the opportunity whenever they are to be seen i am not difficult of access sir for yesterday if my memory does not deceive me you were at my house yesterday i was at your house sir said the young man because then i knew not who you were in pronouncing these words albert had raised his voice so as to be heard by those in the adjoining boxes and in the lobby thus the attention of many was attracted by his altercation where are you come from sir you do not appear to be in the possession of your senses provided i understand your perfidy sir and succeed in making you understand that i will be revenged i shall be reasonable enough said albert furiously i do not understand you sir replied monte cristo and if i did your tone is too high i am at home here and i alone have a right to raise my voice above another's leave the box sir monte cristo pointed towards the door with the most commanding dignity ah i shall know how to make you leave your home replied albert clasping in his convulsed grasp the glove which monte cristo did not lose sight of well well said monte cristo quietly i see you wish to quarrel with me but i would give you one piece of advice which you will do well to keep in mind it is in poor taste to make a display of a challenge display is not becoming to every one monsieur de morcerf at this name a murmur of astonishment passed around the group of spectators of this scene they had talked of no one but morcerf the whole day albert understood the allusion in a moment and was about to throw his glove at the count when morel seized his hand while beauchamp and chateau renaud fearing the scene would surpass the limits of a challenge held him back but monte cristo without rising and leaning forward in his chair merely stretched out his arm and taking the damp crushed glove from the clinched hand of the young man sir said he in a solemn tone i consider your glove thrown and will return it to you wrapped around a bullet now leave me or i will summon my servants to throw you out the door wild almost unconscious and with eyes inflamed albert stepped back and morel closed the door monte cristo took up his glass again as if nothing had happened his face was like marble and his heart was like bronze morel whispered what have you done to him i nothing at least personally said monte cristo but there must be some cause for this strange scene the count of morcerf's adventure exasperates the young man have you anything to do with it it was through haiti that the chamber was informed of his father's treason indeed said morel i had been told but would not credit it that the grecian slave i have seen with you here in this very box was the daughter of ali pasha it is true nevertheless then said morel 
I understand it all, and this scene was premeditated. How so? Yes, Albert wrote to request me to come to the opera, doubtless that I might be a witness to the insult he meant to offer you. Probably, said Monte Cristo with his imperturbable tranquillity. But what shall you do with him? With whom? With Albert. What shall I do with Albert? As certainly, Maximilian, as I now press your hand, I shall kill him before ten o'clock to-morrow morning. Morel, in his turn, took Monte Cristo's hand in both of his, and he shuddered to feel how cold and steady it was. Ah, oh, Count, said he, his father loves him so much. Do not speak to me of that, said Monte Cristo, with the first movement of anger he had betrayed. I will make him suffer. Morel, amazed, let fall Monte Cristo's hand. Count, Count, said he. Dear Maximilian, interrupted the Count, listen how adorably Dupre is singing that line. O oh, Mathilde, idole de mon âme. I was the first to discover Dupre at Naples, and the first to applaud him. Bravo, bravo! Morel saw it was useless to say more, and refrained. The curtain which had risen at the close of the scene with Albert again fell, and a rap was heard at the door. "'Come in,' said Monte Cristo, with a voice that betrayed not the least emotion, and immediately Beauchamp appeared. "'Good evening, Monsieur Beauchamp,' said Monte Cristo, as if this was the first time he had seen the journalist that evening. "'Be seated.' Beauchamp bowed, and sitting down, Sir, said he, I just now accompanied Monsieur de Morcerf, as you saw. And that means, replied Monte Cristo, laughing, that you had probably just dined together. I am happy to see, Monsieur Beauchamp, that you are more sober than he was. Sir, said Monsieur Beauchamp, Albert was wrong. I acknowledge to betray so much anger and I come on my own account to apologize for him, and having done so entirely on my own account, be it understood, I would add that I believe you too gentlemanly to refuse giving him some explanation concerning your connection with Janina. Then I will add two words about the young Greek girl. Monte Cristo motioned him to be silent. Come, <laughs> said he, laughing, there are all my hopes about to be destroyed. How so? asked Beauchamp. Doubtless you wish to make me appear a very eccentric character. I am, in your opinion, a Lara, a Manfred, a Lord Ruthven. Then, just as I am arriving at the climax, you defeat your own end and seek to make an ordinary man of me. You bring me down to your own level and demand explanations. Indeed, Monsieur Beauchamp, it is quite laughable. Yet, replied Beauchamp haughtily, there are occasions when probity commands. Monsieur Beauchamp, interposed this strange man, the Count of Monte Cristo bows to none but the Count of Monte Cristo himself. Say no more. I entreat you. I do what I please, Monsieur Beauchamp, and it is always well done. Sir, replied the young man, honest men are not to be paid with such coin. I require honorable guarantees. I am, sir, a living guarantee, replied Monte Cristo, motionless, but with a threatening look. We have both blood in our veins which we wish to shed. That is our mutual guarantee. Tell the Viscount so, and that to-morrow before ten o'clock I shall see what colour he is. Then I have only to make arrangements for the duel, said Beauchamp. It is quite immaterial to me, said Monte Cristo and it was very unnecessary to disturb me at the opera for such a trifle. In France, people fight with the sword or pistol, in the colonies with the carbine, in Arabia with the dagger. Tell your client that although I am the insulted party, in order to carry out my eccentricity, I leave him the choice of arms, and will accept without discussion, without dispute, anything, even combat by drawing lots, which is always stupid, but with me different from other people, as I am sure to gain. 
"'Sure to gain?' repeated Beauchamp, looking with amazement at the Count. "'Certainly,' said Monte Cristo, slightly shrugging his shoulders. "'Otherwise I would not fight with Monsieur de Morcerf. I shall kill him. I cannot help it. Only by a single line this evening at my house let me know the arms and the hour. I do not like to be kept waiting.' "'Pistols, then, at eight o'clock, in the Bois de Vincennes,' said Beauchamp, quite disconcerted, not knowing if he was dealing with an arrogant braggadocio or a supernatural being. "'Very well, sir,' said Monte Cristo. "'Now all that is settled. Do let me see the performance, and tell your friend Albert not to come any more this evening. He will hurt himself with all his ill-chosen barbarisms.' Let him go home and go to sleep. Beauchamp left the box, perfectly amazed. Now, said Monte Cristo, turning towards Morel, I may depend upon you, may I not? Certainly, said Morel. I am at your service, Count. Still, what? It is desirable I should know the real cause. That is to say, you would rather not. No. The young man himself is acting blindfolded, and knows not the true cause, which is known only to God and to me. But I give you my word, Morel, that God, who does know it, will be on our side. Enough, said Morel. Who is your second witness? I know no one in Paris, Morel, on whom I could confer that honour besides you and your brother Emmanuel. "'Do you think Emmanuel would oblige me?' "'I will answer for him, Count.' "'Well, that is all I require. "'Tomorrow morning, at seven o'clock, "'you will be with me, will you not?' "'We will.' "'Hush! "'The curtain is rising. "'Listen, I never lose a note of this opera "'if I can avoid it. "'The music of William Tell is so sweet.' End of chapter 88 Okay, wow. So that's bad. I had a really hard time watching the last scene play out in my mind at the opera. That was really hard. All of it was hard. It was very, very hard. I imagine it was similarly difficult for you. Luckily, things change rather quickly in this book. Lots happens, especially as we move towards the, the climax and the denouement. That said, I hope you enjoyed hearing a couple of times the fabulous word calumniator. It was the title of this episode and all all it means is a slanderer. I found it hysterically funny because me being my age, the ator affix was what Dana Carvey era Saturday Night Live with the, well, it eventually became the governator, which was for uh, Schwarzenegger, who had been the Terminator, that everything became an aider when, I guess it was Terminator 2 came out. So to have the word calumniator, I just, uh, I honestly stopped and had to look it up the first time I heard it. I just love that. But wow, we are set up for some serious excitement next week. <sighs> so go have a nice, cool drink. Those of you in the Northern Hemisphere, have some ice in a glass that sweats and cools you off so you can relax until next week when we rev right back up again and find out what's going to happen with Albert and the Count. All right, you take care of yourself. I will talk to you soon and we'll have some more fun next week. Have a great one. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. A big thanks to all the Craftlit listeners who support the show by being a premium audio member via craftlit.com slash premium or via patreon.com slash craftlit. Your support for the show is what's kept us going since 2006. If you feel like getting free audio pretty much every week, please consider supporting the show by heading over to patreon.com slash craftlit and pledging what you feel the show is worth to you. If you can't support the show that way, consider leaving a review at iTunes or at our facebook.com slash craftlet page or follow at craftlet on Twitter and share the show with your followers too. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on. <laughs>